What's up guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. So this video is going to be a little bit different. I am over at Nathan's house and I figured we could just have like a little bit of a conversation, kind of like a little back and forth about his tank. The last time I saw this thing it was basically empty. It was just white rock and it has changed a whole lot since I was last here. I've got a couple of questions that we can go over. So if you could, Nathan, tell us about this tank. Like how large is it? How it's kind of structured as far as the plumbing and everything like that goes? Like what, what are we looking at exactly? All right, it's about a 450 gallon aquarium. It's nine feet long by 40 feet front to back, or 40 inches front to back and 26, six inches tall. I played with the idea of going nine feet and then I was kind of concerned that that was too long. And then I was talking with a friend who had gotten an eight foot tank and he said his only regret was not going bigger. So that sealed the deal. And I wanted to add a frag tank. So that's why I left it at nine feet rather than going another foot or foot and a half. But it's all one system, the 450 gallon tank and the about a hundred gallon frag tank all connected into the sump that's, that's housed below the tank. I used to have a six foot, 200 gallon tank, and this was basically the biggest footprint I could take up down in this room. And I, I feel like I've maximized the space and uh, setting this tank up was a lot about efficiency and, and applying a lot of the lessons I'd learned over the past eight years with the 200 gallon tank. The plumbing is much more clean. I'm more conscientious about the wiring and kind of trying to keep that as untangled as possible. They all kind of run together along the same route and they're easy to swap in and out. It becomes a bit of a rat's nest just because of the amount of wires, but I'm actually able to get in and out any device pretty quickly if needed. How long did you have your previous tank set up? I believe it was close to eight years, maybe just shy of eight years. Yeah, so, and for the folks out there that haven't had a tank that long, it's almost like a, I forget what, what those things are called. It's like a, it's where you have a ship and all the original parts of the ship have been basically replaced <laughs> and you have like a new ship. Yeah. But I'm sure that you've learned a heck of a lot from that setup and just kind of retrofitting different things and bolting different stuff on equipment wise onto that old one that you can now kind of take all those lessons and apply to this new build from scratch. Yeah, exactly. The old, the old tank became somewhat of a Frankenstein monster. The plumbing wasn't the most efficient, straight and narrow build. And that would start to get in the way as I added more things here and there or tried to remove things. And the old tank was only a few inches away from the back wall after you took into consideration the plumbing coming out the back. So this tank is actually about almost two feet away from the wall. And I That's something that like people just don't realize is that you really do need to be able to, to get completely behind your aquarium. And especially the bigger the <clears> aquarium <throat> gets, at, at nine feet, I'm not reaching the middle of the back of the tank from the side. But I have a nice channel way to walk back there and, and get back there when I need it. I'm trying, one of my goals is to keep the back of the aquarium clean, not let the coralline algae. I really like the contrast with the black background, so I don't want a lot of coralline algae. So. I get back there every two to three weeks and clean off that back glass over there. Mainly with the razor blade or do you have magnets and stuff? Uh, so far I've only had to use, uh, I have a big white filter pad basically on top on a, a scrubber brush essentially. Okay. It's a nice wide footprint and uh, I'm basically just using a scrubbing pad on the back right now. Huh. Uh, there's been a couple little spots that I'll, I'll use like a glass scraper you use on, on aquariums, but for the most part, I just get up there with that, that scrubbing pad and take care of it. What I noticed, what happens over time, and I'm sure you've seen this before, the softer scrubbing pads and things like that work initially, and that pretty much just lets the really tough stuff grow, and then it gets tougher and tougher yeah. and tougher as, yeah. as oh, you Oh yeah, go. yeah, there's definitely, you can tell there's the, the more persistent stuff that's gonna use, take more of a scrubbing. I have one of those really, like hammerhead magnets yeah. that I use on the glass, the front and the sides. And that thing is extremely strong. I got the biggest one. And even on three quarters glass, like the kids can't move it. I can't, I, and I have to lean into it. It's, it's great, but um, I'll probably use that on the back 
occasionally as well. I always get freaked out by like the super strong magnets because it almost feels like I'm pulling, like hard pulling on the glass <laughs> panel practically. Well, this one is, I have like the lesser, less strong version that I use on the frag tank and I had a long time on my display, old display tank and you can just kind of negotiate it around the corners. This thing is so strong, you negotiate around the corner and it clamps back Slaps. down so hard. I was like, yeah, never again am I negotiating. And I put my hand in, slide them apart, put them in, slide them back together. Even once or twice, I didn't, I wasn't quite smooth with my slide and I had the outside part further away from the glass and wham! Just, yeah. I've learned. <laughs> strong, strong magnets are no joke. Like, no. Have you ever gotten clamped like really hard? I, I had a wave box. I had a wave box. And it had two the like those yeah. H the H uh, yeah yeah magnets. exactly my my pinky got caught once because they clamped together and I couldn't get down I was I started sweating <laughs> and I called for Amber to come down and she came down she couldn't get them apart I said go get a pair of pliers and I'm sweating and she's so upset because she couldn't get them so just get a pair of pliers and we put them in there and reversed opened them and that got my pinky out and I just laid on the ground for a little bit just cried <laughs> yeah just just sweating. Going back to your, I guess your original tank for a, little, for a sec, what kind of inspired you to like get another tank? Just one day 200 wasn't big enough? Uh, I think it was a combination of things. I had started to learn and there's things I wanted to do differently. I wanted to do more open rockscape, not necessarily less footprint in terms of coral placement, but more open underneath the rocks and, and between the rocks, which I kind of think I've achieved here have to hide the closed loops so that's why it's a little bit bulky in areas but um, I wanted to redo the rock work I wanted it was the tank was full I just there was nowhere else to place any corals it got to the point where the maintenance on it was just kind of annoying that they're, they're just it, it kind of got dirty in terms of like the glass and the back on the back there's a lot of things it was either okay I'm gonna totally reboot this or I can go bigger so obviously I, I dreamed of having a bigger tank anyways and uh it no. sounds it sounds weird like first world problems but if you've had a 200 gallon tank for a really long time it actually gets claustrophobic yeah it's so weird to say because i'm sure that there's plenty of people listening that are like very very happy with their 13 gallon nanos and like 200 gallons you guys are crazy but it really does get tight in there and I had corals that I didn't necessarily want in there anymore, but they were just so grown into the rock work and I'd had so, for so long. I have a problem, like there's a coral I may not necessarily like, but I've had it for eight years or nine years. I'm like, ah, do I really want to get rid of it? And even in that point, I got rid of a lot of it and I kept small frags or, or small chunks of it just because I was like, I've had this for so long. The nostalgia. Yeah. This, is, this tank is in the same spot as my frag tank and display tank were. I did canalize a little bit more of this room for the frag, new frag tank, but I wanted to stay within this space here, it's, and my wife wouldn't, you know, that's all she wants. But I also only want one system, so I don't want to have to maintain two sets of parameter, water parameters and, and equipment. Was the previous one, all, that was all plumbed together, right? Correct. That was just one system. Okay. So, but, so this is the same and... Basically the same yeah. same general idea, yeah. Okay. And then just, I just wanted a, a bigger sump, you know, the, the sump design is bigger and op more open now. And Yeah, that makes a huge difference to be able to really get in there and actually do maintenance. Mm -hmm. I think, I've mentioned it before on my channel many times, but I think that people sometimes get caught up in having this like very tightly tailored bespoke sump that has everything in there down to the millimeter of clearance. And it's like, guys, you want to be able to stick your arm <laughs> yeah. in right. every single angle around these things. Mm -hmm. it's, there's so much work that actually has to happen in a, in a sump. So you had brought the spouse. I know some people are going to be wondering, like, how did you manage that part of it? Well, like, what, what, what promises had to be made? We added like 1,400 square feet to the house a couple years ago to give more living space. And oh, you just uh, had to build an extra house. In other yeah, words. I, I built a house on top of my house, pretty much. Almost, oh, okay. Almost doubled the space. It That's was, the key, right there. Yeah, that was phase one of my ultimate plan. <laughs> phase two was going to Hawaii, which we were supposed to go in Jan uh, 
July, June or July this year, but COVID kind of canceled those plans. Uh, totally off topic, but I'm supposed to be in Hawaii right now. Yeah, that's a bummer. Well, it's where else happening. would you rather? You're here in my dragon's lair. I know. Yeah. This is this is it's the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> totally the same thing. There. Yup. She knows how much I like the hobby, so she's been pretty uh, pretty cool about this. Heck, I, the previous tank probably paid for that house expansion. Uh, the previous tank definitely, like selling the coral and stuff, definitely over the past few years had made enough to pay for this system. <laughs> I'm sure it did all right. It's like I buy a lot of stuff from you, and I yeah. know that like I don't buy yeah. nearly the, the quantity of corals that must have come out of that thing. I don't really hustle on uh, trying to sell coral, but they grow, and it's to the point that you got to get rid of trimmings of them. So yeah. They, I've been fortunate to have pretty good success in growing the corals and fragging them and selling them. So. When I first walked in, I was like blown away by how ridiculously clean and clear the water looks. Like, it looks like there's no water there. Yeah, I'm running, I'll show you the UV filter or uh, sterilizer. I'm running that now. I run carbon and then I have filter socks. So those are to be the three main, and the nice protein skimmer as well. I'd say those are the main things. I like to have, I have a lot of flow, I think relative to conventional in terms of the return pumps. I mm -hmm. think I'm pushing a lot of water through the returns and that helps get everything into those filter socks and down into the sump. Help keep things suspended too. Real quick, since you brought up the return pump, he's got an Abyss A200. Yes, and that runs the first, the right three returns on the display tank. Uh huh. And I have to back that down to 70%, or it's between 68 and 70%, or it starts to overwhelm the one and a half, half inch siphon drain. And then it starts to make noise in the secondary drain. So that's why I'm running that. Uh, then I have a JBO one of the JBO pumps that basically 90% of it is the return on the um, frag tank and then a little bit coming out of the far left return on gotcha. the display tank. Gotcha. I had a little bit of a spill yesterday. About 400 gallons ended up on my floor. Here's a little thing I noticed about the uh, Abyss. It has a run dry warning and it'll shut itself off. Good to know. That's what you get when you... Yeah, yeah, it better. <laughs> For the price, it better. Yeah, it better so it happens when, when you like, buy the big danger. brain pumps. Yeah, when it's in danger of destroying itself, it, it, it's nice to turn itself off. Yeah. As far as the rock work goes, when the last time I was here and was recording this tank, it was all star quite dead rock. And now it's taken on that brown patina of time and algae but one thing that I've noticed is that there really isn't anything in the way of like crazy hair algae or anything like that in my show tank was set up a little bit before yours however it's right now covered in hair algae what do you think that the keys are as far as algae control in something like this well I did the cycle with Fritz turbo start and algae barns nitro cycle I think so the, the whole thought of there is that it's, it skips the ammonia stage. You're right into the nitrogen feeding the bacteria. And I think that helped. I also had a lot of seeded biomaterial tubes from the old system that I put into here. And I was taking old water out of the old system and into the new system to help just kind of get that cycle go. And that worked real well. But I think the ultimate reason that I don't have that much algae is because I have an army of tangs in here. So mm -hmm. I think if those tangs weren't in there, there would be a lot messier hair algae. I, earlier this week, I cleaned out the frag tank, but the, I took each frag rack out of the frag tank because they were it was covered in lots of algae and, and turf algae and the bottom of the glass in the, the frag tank was as well. Cleaned those out, scrubbed them. I have added some, <laughs> they're tiny little guys in the uh, frag tank, captive bred yellow tangs. And then there's a couple more tangs I just got some, from some friends. How many tanks in total are there in this big show tank? There are seven. So I have six captive bred ones and then the, uh, the, the mauled up looking old yellow tang, Gramps. He's been, I've had him for many years. So, but the six, I, six yellow tangs that are smaller in the display tank were all captive bred. 
they came in smaller than that, quite a bit smaller, but they've really been growing. They just, they're lawnmowers in there. And I'll take frags from the frag tank that have algae growing on the frag plugs, put them right in the frag rack in the display tank, and within a few minutes, they, they take care of it. So where, where are they from? Where'd you buy them uh, from? They are, the, the company that breeds them is in Biota. Biota, okay. And I got them through them. Live Aquaria. They come through oh, the Wisconsin okay. facility in Live Aquaria, the divers. Divers, actually. But yeah, but they all, they came in healthy. They look good. They had fat little bellies. Their overall body, just because they were so young, looked kind of thin, but that's mm -hmm. just being young tangs. And the ones I got last week, they had just gotten them back in stock. And I think they, they're basically as young as they can be when they ship out. And they are tiny, but they're cute and they're just, they're doing their job too. They're eating. They're almost transparent looking. Yes, yeah, so especially the smallest one, but you can see them picking, right? You and know? you didn't have any issue with like the older tangs, like slitting their throats or anything? No. Well, obviously not these because they're still here, but. Yeah, no. So I got the captive bred yellow tangs in this display tank first. Then I started bringing over the tangs from the old system. Uh huh. And I moved them in there, and I was curious what the Achilles would do because he's big. He's never really been all that aggressive. He kind of seems like a peacekeeper in the old tank. He came in, and he didn't seem to mind at all. And then I added the powder blue and the powder brown tang, and the Achilles couldn't care less about him. Those the two smaller powders go after each other. And then the naso tang, he doesn't seem to mind any other tang either. See, so. this, this is, like, super frustrating because whenever I add new fish... Every tang is like super hyper aggressive. I've, I've seen like the craziest thing. So first off, we're trying to get some little copper bands adjusted. And every single t tank that we put them in that has a tang is trying to kill them. Like actively trying to kill them. The, the tangs that we got when we first set up our tanks, they immediately started trying to kill one another. I had, I still have a, a naso tang. And I put in like a one inch baby, like Melanaris Ras. He tried to kill him. Like, it's just, I have like the, 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 the worst temperament tangs out yeah. there. I don't, uh, I haven't tried to add any fish since like the tang colony has been established in there, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I, it's I, just I like to, I plan to add some, some kind of high priced Rasses in, in the future, but that'll be a little bit still. I'm waiting for the lids to come in, which might be another month or two. But so I have my temporary screen just kind of sitting up there, which <laughs> the fish bounce off of those every day. The yellow tail tamarind, actually, uh -huh. I was just moved the left screen a little bit and I was working in there and it jumped, smacked onto the floor. I picked him up, put him back in there. He didn't even look stunned. And you know, that's, he, he, dropped, he dropped five feet on the concrete hard tile and he didn't seem to mind it. I thought for sure he was a goner. And it wasn't even like the screen, like he didn't have a direct path out of the tank. He bounced off the screen, off the ledge, and then over. But they, they bounce all the time. And then they just splash. Like the tanks get up there and they splash. The back walls have salt stains on them already. Which is like two feet away. Yeah. I, I can't, like, I'll be over here feeding. Like, I, I feed right before I leave for work, so I'm in my dress shirt and tie, and I've had a couple times where they, they just, they <laughs> soaked me. They just, they just hit it at the right point, and, you know, it's on my, I had to go change. It's because they know. They, they, yeah. But they, it, it is fun. Feeding time's fun, because they all come over. I put, I put a little video up on my Instagram and Facebook recently, a couple days ago, of them following me back and forth on uh, just as a herd. And with nine feet, you can really see them swim all the way across. Did you see that video? I did, yeah. yeah and they're moving fast, and it, you, it takes a few seconds for them to get over there. Yeah. It's, it's fun. It's actually swimming. Yeah. Your tanks are a little chippy. The yellow ones especially. I mean, not, not terribly. They just, they have their little, I'm the boss, no I am. But there's, they don't do it for like an hour of death, you right. know. And there isn't one just like huddled in a corner somewhere. Exactly. I feel, I feel it's more natural behavior than getting cornered and slashed up. So, so far so good. We'll see. And I feed them, I feed them a full, a full sheet of nori every day. I put half on one side, half on the other side to give them 
to allow them to spread out. They actually don't fight much when they're actually eating that, though. They all just gather around and take turns. Substrate questions. Have you always had substrate in your in your show tanks? Yep. And this is a special grade, like reef grade, carob sea sand. Um, Which is a little bit chunkier. It's not sugar fine. Oh no, yeah. There's there's a lot of flow in there that sugar fine would not do well. Here's the thing. I, I like the look of aquariums that have a substrate. However, my staff straight up revolts at the idea. Who's the boss, though? You know? Yeah. There's that. <laughs> but at the same sure time, like, yeah. <laughs> See, I think they're just being melodramatic. But... You said that you don't even like really have to clean your substrate. Yeah, it is getting some algae right now. You can see a few spots. It's little bits of algae growing up there. I did turkey baste it a couple days ago just to break it up. So some areas, you can see it's the brownish green, but it doesn't bother me that much. Mm -hmm. Even when that's growing on there, the tanks pick at it a little bit, and a quick turkey basting through the sand bed kind of mixes it up and cleans it up looking anyway. So. Do you have anything like uh, in the way of cucumbers? I have, I have or two sea cucumbers in there, a smaller one and a bigger one. I may add another. They're old though. The the, the bigger sea cucumber has got to be. He's got to be eight years old because he was in my cube, so eight to nine years old. So I'm kind of. I don't know how long they live. And do your wrasses uh, dive in there and keep it stirred as well? Uh yeah, the leopard wrasse and the yellow-tailed tamarind wrasse, and the leopard wrasse will just. He just kicks it up to see if he can kick food up, too. So he does that on occasion in areas. Mm. Uh, but then they go in and they sleep in the sand bed, too. That's one thing that, uh, because most of our tanks now don't have substrate, is I always think that that's kind of like something that's missing from their habitat. I kind of feel guilty about that. Doesn't seem to really bother them that much to, to not have substrate, I guess. Yeah. Actually, I have two leopard grasses in there. I have another smaller one. And then I have the ornate grass and the... Uh, frag tank and he's fine without the sand. So your frag tank does not have substrate? Correct. So since you have both, like, do you have a, a preference? Visually, I, I would always have sand in my display tank. In a frag tank, the whole purpose of it, it's much easier not to have the sand. And you have wrasses in there and it's not that big of a deal? Correct. Hmm. Now, I did have a wrasse he was in my frag tank, and I had a little, in the old frag tank, I had a little tub of sand for him to sleep in, and he was freaking out the first night. He it, he didn't want to go in it anymore in the, the new frag tank, and he was, you could just tell he was an all erratic. So I ended up picking him up and putting him in the display tank, so he's in the display tank now. I've actually done that for you. I have like a, a tub of sand in my in my tanks that have no substrate. And eventually all that sand just gets kicked out. Yes, he would actually, um, he would kick the sand out over a few days and then he'd just lay in the tub. And, <laughs> just and it, lay in the empty yeah, tub. Yeah, it was bare, but that was his spot, so. That's funny. He had he did not transition well to the frag tank, so he got put in the display tank and he seems to be much happier. So he might be sleeping right now, because I don't see him. That is one thing that I wish was a little bit different about my systems is that since mine are like coral farming all the time, all day, every day, there's not a lot of natural rock work for the fish. And I can kind of tell that they're, they would be a lot more calm and act more like regular fish if they had that. I, uh, that was, that's a good point. And after I finished my rock scape and had all the fish in here and everything, I, I, was, I was getting close to nighttime and the fish are trying to find their spots and I looked at it and I was like, there are not enough spots for the fish in here. And you, you can't really tell, but behind the chunks of rock I added just a couple more layers. And I actually planned to take, I just saw it on, maybe it was Bulk Reef Supply. He was talking about his new tank. The rock, there's rock work, but it's rather sparse and there's not a whole lot of good hiding spots. So he took more rubble and basically made like little like caves and little cages. Yeah, dome. And I'm going to make a few of those and put them further in the back just to give a little bit more space for a fish to dive into, hide from the other fish, mm -hmm. a couple of entry and exit points. But there's no real place to go to be totally hidden in this tank. There's I added a couple areas in the back that they can, but 
I was like, yeah, there's just, and I noticed it while the fish were trying to find a spot to sleep and they're kicking each other out of spots. I was like, there's just not a whole lot of good spots for them in here. Well, I guess the benefit of kind of having like this, uh, this very open spidery aquascape is that it's always possible to add more rock. If you have like a wall of rock, it is not easy to then carve out some yeah. negative space. And, and you don't really get the sense of how big the tank is front to back right from looking from the front panel, but there's plenty of room in the back to put uh, little rock caves and you won't even know from the front anyways. So it's not gonna detract from much of anything from this view any. Mm -hmm. So Nice. Real quick, let's cover some lighting, looking at some Orphics here. Over the tank are four or five Orphic Atlantic version fours. And then over the frag tank, the front one is a version four as well and the back one is a version three that was over my old frag tank and uh, it's considerably noticeably different the, the spectrums they give off uh, i'm curious to and see... i actually like version four better than the version three so real quick what's the difference uh just look at but you can see it's more of a violet light okay uh, so, the the, so the, just the, the color the version itself. three the version four is a, a whiter blue and because they're at like similar channel settings oh, okay they're kind of running the same program, but they're just a different mixture of LEDs and that these version fours are really, I really like them. I like the three, but I really like these fours. So right now the, the tank kind of has a more of like a daylight cast as a part of the, whatever, where, wherever we are in the program. Which is actually, we're almost peak light okay. intensity. Nice. For the day. So my guys, so I recently hired a couple more people and they are also very much into like into blues. And so I would say like like uh, only two of us kind of like the daylight look and everybody else is really addicted to like the super blue light. But I like how this looks. It looks just so clean. You can see things so easily. I'll send you the settings I have on my, nice. my channel schedule so you can see what they mix at. But the other thing that I was kind of noticing, at least when um, you had posted some some stuff onto social media, was just like the color rendition of this on camera looks really, really nice. And that's kind of uncommon in a lot of LED fixtures. And I remember years and years ago when I shot Frag Tank under the V3 light, that it was kind of problematic just because of how oddly violet it looked. Mm -hmm. And now this looks super crisp and super color accurate. Yeah, if you shoot the frag tank today, and you might, I can see it right now. Can you see the, looking in the tank? Can you see the difference of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah well one side looks a lot more violet than the other. Yeah. Previously, the lights were being hung differently, and then you came over and saw how I was doing it, and you went with like the, a lower profile ones for over the show tank here. Yeah, there was a couple things, I, I had, a similar hardware that's hanging the, the lights over the frag tank right now over the display tank and it was pretty busy looking but also i had reached the maximum height using that hardware i could get with the the hanging kits and i actually wanted to the uh, lights higher up they were too too low for what i wanted to do i thought they would look nicer basically at the level they are now and it was actually a pretty good answer was to get those rail systems that you were using and uh, mount them right on that floating canopy and it's crazy how nice that that came out isn't it yeah yeah it's like perfect it's, it, yeah it wasn't initially planned exactly like that but then it kind of came together and i still have i'll trim up the uh or i'll i'll have somebody trim up or help me trim up the spacing from those planet floating canopies up to the ceiling to kind of mm -hmm. hide the hardware that's above the floating canopy and the wires up there i'm really happy with them um, but that's part of the future. We got a couple other items. I, I'm going to probably use put cabinetry around the, the stands as well. But that's kind of not on my radar. <laughs> After getting the tanks up and running, it's like that's like the like, easy stuff. It'll happen yeah, when it happens. Uh, yeah, I'm just figure it out eventually. But everything else is going real well. So, what's your methodology for maintaining water chemistry? Let's start with. What is your salt? What's, what salt brand are you using? I use Instant Ocean Reef Crystals. 
and have been for many years. And okay. yes, it leaves gunk in my mixing tank, but I can't argue with the results in the, the aquarium. So you're using reef crystals and automatic water change still? Correct. And probably around 12 gallons a day. Okay. 24 seven, pretty much? Yeah, it breaks it into 150 increments throughout the 24 hour period. So it's a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit in, a little bit out. There's some and, pauses in between. And do you ever do like big system wide water changes as well? I have not yet since this system's been up. Okay. But I, I can, I, I've done it in the past with the old system, so. As far as like calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, how do you keep up with that? So I have a 55 gallon drum of Kalkwasser mix and I just mix it up once then let it settle and I dose about eight liters a day out of that into the tank. So that's partially covers my fresh water top off as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives some al alkalinity and calcium and then I have dosing pumps controlled by the apex that dose two-part mix as well. So I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> supplementing alkalinity and calcium in three different ways with the, the automatic water changes, the uh, Kalkwasser, and the straight up dosing alkalinity and calcium, which I use the dry mix from bulk resupply and mix it up. So as far as the calc goes, uh, that's done with a dosing pump as well, like a peristaltic? Yeah, liter meter. Okay, liter meter is doing that. And two liter meters to do the water change. Correct. And some other type of peristaltic to do the, the BRS stuff? Yeah, like a BRS basic dosing pump. You just plug it into the Apex EV8s, mm -hmm. and then the Apex controls the timing of that. Ever considered calcium reactors? I think I'm going to be in the future, and I've seen those expensive fancy ones that they do like recirculating within the calcium reactor and they have dosing pumps on them. They're very interesting to me. I don't, I've looked at them a couple times and kind of gotten into how they work. And then I kind of forget, forget, I can't describe exactly the mechanics um, behind them. They basically keep the pH at the same with, and, and they can make it lower than general calcium reactors. Or yeah. The way they operate, but they have like basically a controller controlling that there. So I, I've considered that a, a calcium reactor may be necessary in the future as the uh, I've packed this in with a lot more acros. I could see that just because the amount of for, so for calc you can only put in as much calc as you're as you're topping off basically. Correct. Yeah. Two part well that that could cover the rest of it, but that could get also pretty expensive if you're. Yeah putting in a gallon of two-part every day, that exactly. sort of thing. Calcium reactor is kind of nice just because it sets a really gentle baseline for you. But yeah, if you don't need it right now, it's going What out. I like about the dosing pump still is I have the Alcatronic measuring my alkalinity, so I can see if it's dropping up just slightly throughout a course of two or three days, and I can go in there and on the apex, punch up a couple more minutes of dosing throughout the day and take care of it and I see that reflected in the alkal uh, alkatronic testing over the next day or two and okay. really fine tune it remotely you know I, you could do the same with the calcium reactor obviously but I don't know if it's as easy from a remote no no adjusting figures like that with the calcium reactor is way more difficult yeah and it's probably not even recommended Cal uh, calcium reactors are more just like setting a baseline yeah Rather can, than trying to dial in like a specific number. I can see myself being crazy and having a calcium reactor hitting a certain baseline and then tweaking it with dosing alkalinity yeah. uh, to part mixture. So I can see that. Seeing myself get into that. <laughs> no trace elements or anything? No, I do use trace elements now. I, oh, I've okay. used them for a couple of years. Red Sea has a product line. Like... They have a couple product lines that use the letters A, B, C, and D, but this yeah. this you dose the trace elements based off your calcium consumption. So I can kind of calculate how much calcium is being consumed by my tank, and then you dose a certain milliliter amount from there using their trace element line, their A, B, C, and D. What I do with those is I measure out basically how much I need to do a week, and I 
pour it all into my saltwater reservoir, and then that gets dosed into my tank over the course of a week using the, the automatic water changes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a roundabout way, but I, I, it's still dosing over the week the amount that it needs for the week. So this is kind of like a philosophical difference, I guess, but do you test for trace elements? No, but after having that, the old 200 gallon up for eight years, seven and three quarters years of having it running, I sent out one of the ICP tests and uh, everything came back like right dead set in range. Hmm. So, including the trace elements. So, it was like, oh, good enough. It was like, yeah, great. You mm -hmm. know, my, my, <laughs> my estimation, my guesstimation. Kind of just turned out just well. worked out. It's like yeah. if it's working, yeah. no need to know more. <laughs> yeah. Notable is I just tested two days ago this system, and it's the first time I've ever had undetectable nitrates in the system. It's not that I don't have nitrates in there. It's getting soaked up by the coral and the algae. Uh huh. Um, as probably as fast as I can add it. So I've been feeding a little bit heavier just to make sure that the corals are getting their nutrition, which. From what I can see in the growth and the coloration, looks I think good. they are. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. How many hours a week would you say it takes to like maintain this? Like if I was in a crunch and I I was just trying to make sure it, it's running healthy, I could probably let's say maybe a max three hours. I could get it max done a week. A week. Wow. I could. I it that I mean that's like I'm. I'm pressed for time. I probably need three hours throughout the week to, to scrub some stuff down, replace a few things, check on the salt reservoir. That just goes to show you, like, if you, if you plan your systems out pretty well, they, they get easier. Yeah, I would say if I really needed to, I could probably get everything done in an hour and a half over the course of a week. Now, currently, I play around with things a little bit more. I'm always keeping the glass nice and clean. My daughter actually calls the frag tank her tank because she's she's taken an interest and she's she's actually pretty good at scrubbing that glass. So that's that it's that's cool. it's not a it's it's not a huge chore, but it's nice that she does it. She'll help me scrub the skimmer. Sometimes help taking the filter socks out, put the new ones in. She won't scrub the filter socks or <laughs> rinse those, but she'll she'll replace them. So is that like a weekly thing though, the filter socks? Uh, it's like twice a week. They fill yeah. up, they jam up. That's one of the reasons why I don't do that. It's like that's just too much. Yeah, but then I see how much gets filtered out by the filter socks and like yeah like i it's it is a, a, a chore but at the same time like man it takes a lot out like you see one of those big tangs poop <laughs> and you, most of it gets into the filter socks you're like yeah that's a lot that i'm, <laughs> I'm filtering out pretty quick instead of letting it sit, settle down somewhere in there that explains a lot i mean it's like your uh, the how clean your tanks stay with less maintenance and all yeah, it's like you're, you're, you're doing like five things that are different than how I do things. So it's always kind of cool to to hear about how people are doing stuff differently because, yeah, it explains a lot of, you know, why you're experiencing something very different. Having had this tank up for a few months now, are there things that you would have done differently kind of going back? Because when I set up my stuff, it's you, you, you can plan out so much. But then there's always like a couple things that don't quite work out the way you thought they would. Some things that's like, well, it seemed like a good idea in practice. It was, it just didn't work out or something. Or was there just some complete oversight that you wish that like, had I, had I known that this was going to be such a thing, I would have gone back and completely done something different. Any, any kind of. Uh, we touched like on that? the lights and you know, I never actually had a great, like I've been thinking about this tank for two and a half years before we actually executed the plan for it. And I never had a great feeling on how I was going to do the lights. And you you came, I think you mentioned if the floating canopy would be great to throw up the power supplies up there, which is 100% correct. I wasn't quite sure. And obviously there's been a couple di different iterations of how I hung the lights from the canopy. So that was one thing. I like where it is now. The plumbing underneath the stand over the sump, there's just one or two pipes that I can change out eventually just when I had the motivation to get in there and do it. They're a little low, like just over the top of the sump. And there's a lot of little, not a lot, there's a couple little minor things I would probably tweak over time, but nothing, anything, I'm trying to think, anything that was a, an issue I took care of in the first month. Mm -hmm. 
overall though it came out it, it's been pretty smooth the plumbing of it a friend of mine and myself we did it over the course of about two days and i was kind of cutting and measuring and then he was gluing and that ended up being great and then we would when we came to a certain section we discuss it and how we wanted to do the layout and 95 percent of it is great and there's just a couple of things after the fact you get the, <laughs> everything running you're like oh i would have rerouted this a little bit different and it can be done because i used a lot of unions and stuff like that so that won't be an issue i wasn't quite sure with the two closed loops powered by the vectra l2s i wasn't sure if i was going to need any power heads and i felt that after about a, a few weeks watching the flow in there, I decided to add a couple power heads on the back that shoot out towards the front. You can't really see them because they're behind the rocks. And then give a nice circulation around the tank. I put a MP60 on the side back mm -hmm. right. So you added three pumps on a nine foot tank. That's, you got pretty close the, on the first time. Yeah, with the two closed loops yeah. in, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's pretty good flow. No indications that any of the corals are unhappy with the flow. And you get a lot of flow from the, the middle with those closed loop in between the rocks and everything. So, and it's it's funny, like I'm, I look at a torch or a frag, a frog spawn, and I'm like, I don't even know how water's flowing in that direction with where everything is. It's just the circulation patterns. And it's funny, I, I'm like, I, whatever, there's flow there. I just don't know how it's getting to that direction in that spot, so. Yeah. And I have them on the reef crest modes, the Vectros and the... Uh, oh, you actually, so you have them on some kind of program thing. Yeah, so they, they go up and down in intensity throughout the day, you know, over the course of a couple minutes. Mm. And they're all, you know, so there's a lot of variation in the, the flow pattern. And then the uh, Rossmonts on the back are in random mode too. Okay. There's a lot of variation in the flow and in the intensities. And then the frag tank, there's just one closed loop and the returns, and they do pretty well too. So what are like the next steps? Um, are you pretty much done for like a really good long time or? In terms of equipment and everything, yeah, other than and cabineting, putting the cabinetry around the outside, which I'm thinking of doing something pretty simple, just white straight paneling look on the outside of the tanks. I, I've seen something like that or on the, the stands. I've seen that in the past and I kind of like, I like the look of this right now, the black and white. Mm -hmm. Kind of got that stormtrooper thing going on. Yeah. But the wife says she would prefer it closed in. So. Uh huh. Because she's down here so often. <laughs> you can see it from the kitchen. <laughs> you can see. That. Oh damn. <laughs> yeah. So that'll probably that and also actually the uh, huge light spill the light spill out when those are on. It's kind of. Oh, that's true. I can see. It's pretty that. significant, and actually, it bounces off the walls and lights up the reef tank to a, a light dim even in the middle of the night. So, so this is barely making any any noise, but we well, started. We Go started ahead. messing with some, some uh, Dynamat, and if you just put like that on the back of whatever paneling you mm -hmm. put in, like it's going to like cut out a ton more noise even. Yeah, that's another thing I was going to say. Yeah, there's not a lot of noise, but adding the cabinetry on the front and the sides will really cut down the noise. Let's chit chat about the sump. So going from left to right, what I see is all the, the various drain lines coming in, Looks like it goes through a filter sock section and then through a refugium type section and onto a skimmer chamber and then finally onto a return pump chamber. That is all correct. That's pretty much it there, huh? Yep, yep. the refugium has a lot of those bio media cubes in there and then some uh, chato and nasty other algae that's growing in there and in between the refugium and the skimmer chamber i'm seeing some filter media is that both carbon right now yeah hang in there yep. yeah both carbon no gfo or anything like that correct and then it's a bit of a drop off from the refugium chamber to the skimmer chamber uh -huh. and uh it's because of a design change i made after the fact so it's a bit of it's quite a waterfall because there's a lot of water pumping through there and to kill the noise of that waterfall, I took some of the coarse, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, filter media and stacked it up there on a stand to break up that waterfall. And uh, you still hear a bit of a trickling sound, but not like 
it would be if it wasn't there. So it's not horrible. Correct. And that was just uh, that's kind of like the rough draft of the sound silencer on there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's worked so well that I haven't really chose to go back in there and do anything more about it. I'll probably refine the design over time. Does the skimmer section stay consistent? No, but I have everything dialed in that it pretty much does. Because your top off is automatic and everything. Correct. Uh, yeah, actually, I not the the plan was to run an automatic top off, but I don't because I don't need to. I mm -hmm. have it dialed in with that Calquasser right now. Okay. And the evaporation rate and it the level in there changes very slowly over time because it's kind of a large area. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a it does become an issue at times if I'm not keeping an eye on it. Now to automate it for times when I'm not here. I will have a sensor top off going. But yeah. I, just, I haven't needed to do that so yet. Does, so it stays consistent with the return section? Yes. Because okay. I so at least it's, it's at least it's like half the damn something that, yeah. that it's yeah. working with. Yep. And that was just because I changed things up. Originally it would have been consistent in there. Mm-hmm. But Happens. I changed it. Yep. Yep. And it's it's I was gonna put add more add baffles back in there, but it's been so easy as mm -hmm. is that i have not i mean you've seen how, how how i have myself it's one level it's yeah. like the yeah. whole thing it's exactly just one that was level. part of the thought was like you know what fan can do it <laughs> i'll and be he, able to manage he, this he never screws anything up <laughs> all right well that's pretty much what i kind of had some some thoughts and questions on any last minute things you can think about that we should point out that might be interesting um, I don't know. Some people might be like, why does he have huge colonies already? But those were already in the old system. Things went real well with the transition. That was an all day thing. I thought it was a good little project. That move, good 12 hours. Mm. Oh, the day the day we moved the old system across the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was more, I, I didn't have that time constraint to, to move stuff out of the old system into the new system. So I did a, bits and pieces here and there. Did you lose anything in the move back? I lost a couple frags that weren't doing well anyways when I moved them from the old tank into the new system, but they already looked like they were on their way out. Gotcha. But I didn't lose any fish, no fish. or any of the big colonies. Nice. I just recently lost a colony of the red dragon. But, but it wasn't from the move. It was just because... Yeah. By the way... Because I probably put it in a bad spot. The whole red dragon thing's a joke because any, any time I get a frag from Nathan, it, it, it immediately dies in my care. So... Well, you're not going to get any frags for a little while. <laughs> Does could scratch that off my worry list. But that thing had gotten so out of control multiple times because it grows so fast that um, I'm not heartbroken not to have it right now. So, oh well. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the little overview and conversation with Nathan about his new tank. I am going to start shopping from some of his collection and. Uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to toss it into the comments below, and we will see you guys next time. Happy reefing.